American Tom Hargrove was living an idyllic life in Cali, Colombia. One snap decision would lead him to the brink of death high in the Andes. And I said, who are you? And he said, Fark. It's a simple negotiation. They have a product. You have to pay for it if you want it back. If it doesn't work and they don't get money, the solution is pretty simple. It costs about 25 cents. been my profession. It started out in the Vietnam War. I was a young army lieutenant assigned as an advisor. And that was when the first high yielding rice varieties were coming out of the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. And I helped spread those rice varieties down in the Mekong Delta in the midst of the war. After I got out of the army, we lived in the Philippines and I spent 19 years following the world's rice crop. And then later, I joined the International Center for Tropical Agriculture called SEAT, based in Cali, Colombia. Colombia was a very pleasant place to be. The people are the most friendly people in the world. We lived, they call them condominio, like condominium, surrounded by a high wall with a security guard at the gate. We enjoyed it a lot. It was a good life. I knew Colombia was the kidnapping capital of the world with, what, eight people a day who were being taken at that time. But what people said was that I wouldn't have to worry about it because, you know, we're not a big oil company or a big bank or something. We're an agricultural research center helping poor farmers. I overslept and I was late for work. <laughs> It was a 45-minute drive from where we lived to the research center. I was on the Pan American Highway. I had just finished reading a book by Robert Pulzer, and he gave 12 rules for a better life. One was always take the scenic route. I could either go through downtown Cali, bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, which I hated, or I could drive through the Colombian countryside, a beautiful route. I thought, Fulgham is right. So I turned right off the Pan American Highway. I was driving fast. A department head shouldn't be late for work. You should set a, you know, a good example. And I passed a soldier. I didn't think anything about it, because roadblocks are a part of life in Colombia. Once a car passed that guy in that, that point, you, there was no way to turn around. So I thought, what's the Colombian army? I didn't worry about it. They're looking for guerrillas, for criminals, for drugs, for arms. And usually, if they see you're a foreigner, they just wave you on through. And I heard them talking, I heard the word gringo. Two men told me to get out of the car. I said in Spanish, I work for the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. I'm on my way to work. So I start talking about rice and beans, cassava, agriculture. They don't care. And they tell me to get in the back of a pickup. And I said, who are you? And he said, Fark. And all at once, the pickup takes off. 
Well, I knew that FARC was the narco guerrillas. They got their money from drugs and kidnapping. They were stealing cars. And I came into it. The term in Colombia for this is called pesca milagrosa. That means miracle fishing. I was the fish that day. After maybe an hour, hour and a half, we stopped. And one of them started imitating the way one of the people at the roadblock was begging, pleading for his life. And I thought, well, no matter what I do, you know, don't break down, don't lose your dignity in front of these people. We had straight up the mountains. And I thought, am I being kidnapped by guerrillas in South America? You know, this can't be happening. But it was. Fifty-five-year-old American Tom Hargrove had been kidnapped by FARC guerrillas. The news quickly reached the authorities, and the U.S. Embassy in Bogota immediately assigned FBI agent Oscar Tejeda to assist on the case. There were a number of individuals who drove up on the incident as it was taking place, so they reported what they saw to the authorities. And then, it's just like a jigsaw puzzle, the pieces began to fit together, and it became apparent that there had been a kidnapping and that Mr. Hargrove had been taken. That morning, when Susan Hargrove returned from running an errand, one of her husband's colleagues was waiting with the bad news. Susan immediately called Tom's brother, Rayford, in Texas. Susan called and she said, sit down, shut the door, I've got something to tell you. I thought somebody had died, of course, and then she said, Tom's been kidnapped. That moment on our world and her world was completely upside down. What did I learn in the Army? And I remembered that one thing that the Army stressed was your best chances of escape are as soon after you're taken as possible, especially if there's confusion. But there was no way. I was surrounded by guerrillas. The commander of the roadblock, and he said, uh, Mayaman Rambo. My name is Rambo. I asked Rambo, I said, am I being held for ransom? And he said, yes. I know eight foreigners who've been kidnapped in Colombia. And of those eight, two are definitely dead, and three more almost uh, certainly dead. After several days' march through the high Andes, Tom and his captors arrived at a permanent camp. There was a one-room hut up there. On the outside, they put a piece of like canvas across it in a wooden platform, and that's where I stayed. And at night, they would have uh, guerrillas, somebody, one or two, guarding me. By chance, Hargrove still had two blank checkbooks and a pen in his pocket. I thought, you know, I really ought to start writing down what's happening, even though they're probably going to take it. So I took the checkbooks, I tore out deposit slips, anything like that. So I started writing what was happening. And I had a money belt. I was so fortunate because I had that money belt absolutely packed with diary, with things that I'd written. My diary was the most important thing of all. It's the only thing I had. It's like being taken suddenly and nailed in a box or a coffin. You're left there in the silence and darkness while the rest of the world goes on. A 
A lot of people, they think about uh, gorillas in South America, they have the idea of a disenchanted intellectual, leftist intellectual who's left the university to fight for the rights of the oppressed. Most were from 12 years old to 19, uh, illiterate or barely literate. The commander of the roadblock where I was taken was Rambo, but after a few days, he rode off and Waco was in charge. Waco was 15 years old. He claimed to have a second grade education. Viva Waco! Viva! I heard Waco tell the troops a couple of times, though, that soon Colombia would be a revolutionary Marxist country like Cuba, China, and Japan. Japan is not a revolutionary communist country. Viva el pueblo! Viva! Que viva el pueblo! Viva! He couldn't read. He was illiterate. I later learned that he couldn't count. And I'm thinking, boy, your life's in the hands of somebody who can't even count? A third of the guerrillas were women. And if I had to classify them from the least cruel to the most cruel, I would classify the women in both extremes. The women could really be mean. Malena would do things, and she'd put soap in my drinking water. Now, that sounds like a high school thing, but it wasn't funny at all. I was really, really angry. If God gave me the power of revenge, I'd say, OK, I'd like to take out Malena first. There was nothing to do, nothing to read. Uh, you know, if you're in a camp of illiterates, you're not going to find the complete work works of Shakespeare around there. Three weeks after Tom's kidnap, FARC headquarters contacted his wife, Susan. The family received information uh, in a letter uh, detailing to them how they should proceed, that they should get a low-frequency radio so that there could be communications and that the, they should then turn to a particular channel, and then there'd be an interaction over the radio as to how to proceed. The Hargroves found a, a um, very competent young man who would serve as their voice uh, over the radio. The young man was Robert, a neighbor who spoke Spanish with a Kali accent, an important ruse to convince the guerrillas that the Hargroves were not getting professional help. In fact, Tom's brother had hired a specialist British kidnap and ransom company to work in tandem with Oscar Tejeda. We had to learn what the protocol was. So from that point on, we let ourselves be led by the people that were experts in the field. The men in England said, you put up with these people, you don't smart off to them, you be as polite as you can, don't lose your temper, because they, all they've got to do is cut that radio off. We don't know where they are, they know where we are. It wasn't just guerrillas who posed a threat. The Colombian army was engaged in a full-scale war with FARC. If the army discovered the location of FARC's camp, there was a very real danger that they would launch an all-out attack and Tom be caught in the crossfire. So Oscar Tejeda told us how to get secure telephones like the kind that the president would use. I had one, he had one, Susan had one, so we could talk every day on a daily basis, provided we had that telephone. And it would encrypt our phone conversations and decrypt them on the other end, and somebody could tap our phones, all they got was a bunch of useless buzzies. I would run every day. After a while, I quit that. I really didn't have the energy to uh, do a lot of running. I certainly was not gaining weight, <laughs> you know, and I was getting thinner and thinner. I thought about food all the time. I'm just fantasizing about the best meals I'd ever had. Tandoori chicken in Delhi, those 15 course meat dinners in Brazil, fried chili crabs in Sri Lanka, steamed mussels in Amsterdam, corned beef sandwiches in New York City. If I ever leave here alive, I'll never again worry about the cost of a meal. You 
my treatment varied so much. They would go down to the river to bathe, and they would take me with them, you know. Well, I was glad to do that because it gave me something to do. Well, I hated to do it because to go in the mountain, those icy mountain streams when you're cold, you hardly stand to go in the water. But I always did because I thought if I don't go in that water and bathe, then they, maybe they won't take me anymore. The women all wore black bras and black bikini underwear. Actually, it may sound exciting, but I'd, I'd have rather been somewhere else. As far as I can tell, for the most part, most of the women were pretty well public property. They were just pretty promiscuous. One of the gorillas was openly gay. He seemed to have quite a bit of uh, activity uh, with some of the others. <laughs> and I remember uh, Waco got drunk, and he sort of went out of control. And Waco was yelling, quiero mujer, I want a woman. He kept saying to the different girls, come here, you know, and they, they wouldn't come. And, you know, he was out of control. These guys were not really soldiers. Every four weeks, supplies would come up by mule. Supplies would be rice, ammunition, soap, and this time a load of liquor came, Colombian brandy and basuco. And that is the dregs of the cocaine processing, what's left over, rolled into a cigarette and smoked. Uh, the word means bazooka. It's like crack cocaine. Uh, the gorillas got stoned on basuco and drunk on brandy and they started playing with their weapons. Their ideas of gun safety are not like my daddy taught me on the farm out in West Texas. As the party noise increases, I hear another ominous sound, rifle bolts being slid ammo clip being inserted. Someone cuts loose from the door of the hut with an AK-47 on full automatic. The noise is deafening. I hear drunken shouts and someone shooting a 45 into the air. Hot, spent cartridges bouncing off of the canvas. I'm like right there between all of them and they're all drunk and stoned. And I would have laid down on the floor, but there was no floor, it was just mud. And it's so cold, and you could never you, you could never get dry. And I thought, I'm just going to lay here and take my chances on getting shot. These were not the kind of people you would want to invite to your Christmas Eve party. Next morning, though well, they were still drunk and still stoned, Viajito started spraying the side of the mountain with his salt rifle. I looked up, and there's a cow laying on its back, kicking its hooves in the air. And I thought, oh, viejito, drunk and stoned, and you accidentally shoot a cow. You know, that is bad. When Waco came back, and he saw that dead cow, well, he thought he was in really bad trouble. And he went insane. Uh, his eyes got big, and he'd fire into the air. The guerrillas depended on the support of the local peasants. FARC headquarters would not react kindly to news that Huaco's squad had just shot one of their precious cows. So the guerrillas were afraid of them. They all went back to that one-room hut and to, went to sleep it off. I thought I got away, and I went to that little tent against the side. At noon, I could hear them cooking, and I went into the hut. I went up, and I was slicing a, a piece of onion, and Waco came into the hut. Remember, this guy's been drunk and stoned on bad cocaine for about 20 hours by now. 
and he comes up behind me and he put the muzzle behind my head. He decided that you know he was in terrible trouble and that I was to blame. He shot over my head right through through the roof. So help me, I did not move. I didn't jump, I didn't flinch. I thought, you know, I knew that I was very close to death, and if I did the wrong thing, I'd be dead. This guy is absolutely insane. He's almost killed you once, and he may come back and kill you. The other gorillas went back to butcher the cow. I wasn't allowed to go to the area where that cow was, but I thought, I'll take my chances. There's Huaco. I didn't know that he was there. So I said, Waco, I know it's a terrible thing that's happened up here today, but I want you to know that you can depend on me, and I'll do everything I can to help you. I went back to my little tent. And all at once, I hear a burst of three rounds on full automatic and a woman screams. 15 minutes later, well, Milena comes by, and she's crying. And she said, in Spanish, she said, Waco committed suicide. And so in the confusion, I went back to the hut. And on Waco's bunk, well, they had two bottles of brandy. Then I thought, Hargo, you're not going to get a chance like this. You better go for it. So I grabbed a bottle of brandy. I thought, now you're dead, and I'm alive, and I stole your bottle of brandy. I like that. American Tom Hargrove had been held for over a month by FARC rebels in Colombia. After a two-day binge on booze and cocaine, Huaco, the guerrilla's leader, had committed suicide. That night, they put some ribs of the cow on, a, on the fire. And they brought me a, a rack of these ribs. And there's not a T-bone steak in the state of Texas as good as those ribs of that old cow were that day. And having dead Waco laying out there didn't hurt my appetite one bit. So far, there had been no ransom demand from FARC and Tom's family had no idea whether he was even alive. The first thing you learned about a hostage negotiation is they make sure that you're not negotiating for a dead body. Adelante, adelante. Well, as gruesome as it is, you have to make sure the guy's alive. We asked the guerrillas for a proof of life, something that would establish the fact that Mr. Hargrove was alive. <laughs> A gorilla rode up on a horse. It had a package, and I wondered what it was. They put a blanket against the wall, and they bring out a video 8 camera, and they tell me to send a message to Susan. Susan, I'm alive. I'm in Espanol, in Espanol. Susan. So I start again, and I speak in Spanish. So I made that uh, videotape, and I knew that that was uh, proof of life. After weeks of inaction, the family received the videotape. Susan, I'm alive. I'm in the mountains. En español, en español. Susan, estoy vivo. Para la recompensa, por favor. Te amo. In the same package was a ransom demand for $6 million. You know, they could have asked for $20 million. The demand means Mr. Argo is most likely alive. Now we have to determine how we proceed and how we negotiate in order to bring this down. Because if you pay too quickly, you're going to be constantly asked for more and more money. It's a process, it, and it's not something that you can just pay and walk away from. One of the techniques that they use is that they just don't speak to you. And they tell you, look, when you have your money, give us a call, 
And if it's something that, you know, that we're interested in listening to you about, we'll talk to you. And that's what, what, that's what is known as the silence. Most large international companies working in Colombia quietly pay the ransom. Tom's employer, a non-profit organization, was initially reluctant to do this. The organization that Mr. Hargrove was working for at the time was concerned that if they paid money for Mr. Hargrove, that would then result in a rash of kidnappings of other executives in country and their employees who were working in the fields uh, by suggesting to, these, to the group that had taken Mr. Hargrove, well, if we'll pay for him, we'll pay for someone else. Tom's wife, Susan, flew to Miami to meet his brother, Rayford, to discuss how the family could raise the ransom money. The Hargrove's elderly father owned a large farm that would be sold off at his death. So Rayford thought they should borrow against Tom's future inheritance. Two months after Tom's kidnapping, he received a letter from Fark HQ. I opened the letter, starts out, Respetado Dr. Hargrove, respected Dr. Hargrove. We've learned the following about you. Number one, you're a full colonel in the United States Army. I thought, I'm dead. You know, I'm just dead. I said, number two, you're an expert in counter guerrilla warfare. I said, number three, you were a hero in the Vietnam War. Would you like to answer these charges? I thought, my God, what they have me charged with is a lot worse than the truth. That night, five guerrillas came to the little tent thing against the thing where I was. Javier, I saw, was carrying a chain. And I thought, what's the chain for? And I said, why are you chaining me? I wasn't chained before. And they said, orders. I was chained at night, and during the daytime, they'd take the chain off. The bottle of brandy that I stole from Waco, I rationed that brandy. <laughs> and finally, uh, on Thanksgiving night, I thought, anywhere where there are Americans, they always celebrate Thanksgiving because they always had the turkey dinner. And I thought, about 6 o'clock, they'll probably be having drinks. So I saved the last swallow of brandy until that time. Two and a half months after being kidnapped, Tom Hargrove was on the move again to an even more secure location. Next morning, we left that camp, the Valley of Death, and we went back down to the valley below, up the river, through the forest, up the hills again. They kind of own these mountains up there. The high Andes, where I was, was cold and wet. It's a swamp. Rains all the time. Everywhere there are springs. You're always wading through mud. I fantasized about, uh, you know, a, a Black Hawk helicopter coming over and, and taking out this whole group and rescuing me. But I realized that probably if that happened, I would be taken out along with it. And we came to another camp. I called it El Valle de la Sombra, which means the Valley of the Shadow. It was always overcast and dark, but also I also meant that proverbial, yea, though I'm walking through the Valley of the Shadow of Death. That's really why I called it that. And it was a, a wooden building of hand-hewn planks. No windows. I got some food! Comida! Comida! I kept asking for food. And they'd say from outside, they'd say, we don't have any food. And I knew they had food. And I thought, what are they doing now? Are they going to starve me? And are they going to ask me to, uh, to sign some sort of a confession? Well, I was afraid that I'd be not only starved, but beaten up or tortured for information that I didn't have in the first place that I couldn't share if I wanted to. 
you've got to control the rage and despair. You have no rights. Only those with the guns have rights. And they have almost total control over your life. They can make you miserable. They can kill you, and they may before this is over. The only thing you control that they can't take away is your spirit. Hey, you didn't go. So after 36 hours there, they brought my first meal. The loneliness, I guess, was the worst part of it. I found the nights were the best because when night came, it meant another day was over. The worst part of the time was in the morning when you woke up, because I thought, what am I going to do to keep from going insane today? I'd have tried to escape, but there was never a chance. All these camps, as far as I knew, there's only one trail coming in and out. I will not go crazy. I'll get through today. Then tomorrow may be better. My strength, my courage, I seem to be losing them. I must take hold of myself. I must fight grief and despair. Three months after the ransom demand, the radio in the Hargroves Carly house suddenly crackled into life. The FARC guerrillas were ready to resume negotiations. The Hargroves offered $240,000 for Tom's release, and in return, demanded another proof of life. One day, they brought a, a Polaroid camera and a newspaper, and they took my picture holding the newspaper. You know, the newspaper was four days old, but it proved I had to have been alive. Well, I knew they weren't taking that photo for their photo album, so I knew that something was going on. Uh, I recall traveling with Tom's boys and we went to a local hamburger joint where we had been told that the proof of life would be in an envelope in a bathroom stall. And when we got it back, it had a picture of Mr. Hargrove holding a newspaper that was, I believe, two or three days old. He looked awful, really bad look in his eyes, and I thought he had lost it, was losing his mind. I said, we've got to get him out of here pretty quick because look, at, he's in bad, bad shape. He's obviously lost lots and lots of weight. He's suffering from malnutrition. And he had a real blank look in his eyes, and I thought, we, we are running out of time. Finally, almost four months after Tom Hargrove was kidnapped by FARC guerrillas, his family agreed to pay $240,000 in Colombian pesos. Both ears were infected, and that was terrible. That was so painful. I'd wake up in the night, and the, my, would, these infections would break, and I'd have dried pus and blood uh, on my face tried to send mental messages to Susan. I would build up and sort of then start to try to force the message to go out. Well, it was very simple messages. And finally, you know, my message was, I'm alive. I started praying to my mother. And thought, you know, maybe if she'd passed it on, <laughs> that would be better. And my mother had died the year before. Eventually, the Hargroves received instructions on where and when to deliver the money. Kidnapping is so common in Colombia that they were able to hire a professional bagman to hand the cash over to the guerrillas. say thank you very much and they just leave and he doesn't show up and you wait a minute where's Tom so I'll screw you we'll find you'll find him soon enough and I warned Susan not to be uh, too uh, confident that Mr. Hargrove would come out as a result of this payment because the pattern at the time for the subversive groups was that they were trying to get 
at times two and three bites of the apple. Weeks, then months passed since the ransom was paid, but there was no sign of Tom. Desperate, his wife and two sons made an appeal on a local television station. The guerrillas responded immediately. They called back on the radio and now they said, well, we thank you for the down payment. That's a really nice down payment. Now we want the rest of the money. We want the real money. You either negotiate with us or, or we'll send you a dead body. Eight months after American Tom Hargrove was kidnapped in Colombia, his captors issued an ultimatum. Pay another ransom or they deliver a corpse. So we finally give them another $100,000. Some people that we were in contact with at the time thought that was stupid. Red Oscar didn't think it was stupid, but some people did and said, you've already given them so much money now, another $100,000 are just bleeding you dry. As I recall, the payment in total was like $365,000. And I think 240 was paid on the first payment and another 125 was paid on the second. The second payment seemed to do the trick. The FARC guerrillas told Tom's family where he could be picked up. Susan and the boys waited for hours at the location. But Tom never arrived. Ten months after being kidnapped, Tom had no idea the ransom had been paid. And even if the FARC guerrillas had wanted to release him, they now had other concerns. The Colombian army had the guerrillas trapped up there. You can hear artillery off in the uh, distance. And they were cleaning out drug laboratories. From then on, we're always running from and hiding from the Colombian army. We stayed there, and the guerrillas were all on the run. It was early in the morning, just before sunrise, and I heard someone outside say, Le toca de salir. I said, what? And he repeated, that means it's your time to leave. And I said, where? He said, back to Cali, to your family. I said, when? I said, in 45 minutes. A spotter plane comes over, and it's a free fire zone that the Colombian army will shoot anything on the ground. And when the spotter plane comes, well, I'm hiding, everybody's hiding, I'm in a riverbed against a bank, but the, the plane sees us and it starts circling. And then a gunship, a helicopter comes. I think, oh my God, I'm on my way home and I'm going to be killed by the Colombian army. And the chopper started circling where we'd been. and we kept moving. We got away from them. They said, okay, Tomas, they say if we keep going, we may run into the Colombian army ahead. So we're going to release you here. They said, okay, follow this trail and you'll come to a road. When you come to the road, go to the right and you'll keep on going and you'll find people. I shook hands with each one, and I told each one, I said the same thing. Uh, Tenga cuidado y vaya con Dios. Be careful and go with God. I didn't mean it. But under these circumstances, I wasn't going to say, screw you guys. Wait till I tell the Colombian Army what I know about you. And then I turned around, and I said, today is August 22. And then they went up the trail, and I was alone. 
and I, I, I wrote Time and I wrote uh, I'm Free at Last. That was the last uh, journal diary entry, I think. I kept walking and finally, late in the afternoon, I came to a house, a little house. I, it was a young potato farmer. He said, I have a motorbike. I'm gonna give you a ride. And he never starts the motor, we're just coast. You know, there's no point in using any gasoline for this. The garage door was open, and I walked through the garage door, and I yelled, Anybody home? I was on the phone with Susan when he walked in the door. Susan starts screaming, and I thought, OK, they've thrown his body on the front porch. At least this is over. He thought that it, my body had been dumped there, because there had been another kidnap in the area, and the guys body was dumped in the driveway and he assumed it was my body and then I picked up the phone and I said you know hi Rayford he picked up the phone and said hello Rayford how are you it's Tom I'm, I'm, I'm home I'm home so we just could not believe it he'd been let go and then just actually walked in the door of his house today Tom and Susan are back in America in Alabama. Tom published his diary as a book and occasionally gives lectures on surviving the kidnap ordeal. This whole thing affected my family more than it did me. In a way, that may sound strange, but I think this was harder on Susan and the boys than it was on me. If my family had not been what they were and what they are, well, there is no question I wouldn't be here. And I wouldn't be walking along the Tennessee River with my dog I would be somewhere up in those Andes uh, dead, and nobody would probably ever find out uh, where I was uh, uh, buried. Or